I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I have Izzy on with me from Contemporary Insurance. We haven't talked in quite a few months. He's been a busy guy changing the birth world around the U.S. And he's given me 30 minutes of his wonderful time this morning. And I always really enjoy, if you haven't heard any of Izzy's talks yet, we've got quite a few. About every four to six months, we've done a conversation. Very key topics with midwives and birth centers and insurance. Izzy has a wealth of experience I'll let him expand on um, advocating for midwives and being able to protect ourselves. So thank you, Izzy, for joining me today. My pleasure, Leslie. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, today I thought we would launch right into discussion of claims expectations and um, what are midwives going to see when they practice and how do they plan for all of that? Because uh, it is a, a real issue. I mean, anyone who's been in midwifery for any period of time um, knows that you can do everything right and still have a bad outcome. And if there's a, a lawyer in, in, the, uh, in the in the area, there's a really good chance you're going to get sued, especially if it's a serious injury. Um, I've been selling malpractice insurance and working with midwives for over 40 years. Um, and uh, we have the largest program in the country. So we have a wide breadth of experience with, um, with midwives and claims um, and the way that they practice. Uh, what I've been noticing lately, which has been a little bit of a concern, is that more midwives are actually canceling coverage and not purchasing tails. Mm -hmm. And the tail insurance issue is an important issue. So I thought I would address that a little bit, answer any questions that Leslie has as we go through this, um, and take it from there. So um, we'll start with the basics, is you don't make any assumptions that the midwives that are listening to this, maybe those newbies, what's the what's a tale? What what's the difference of choosing and not? Go to the basics first. Sounds like a plan. So um, the first thing is to recognize that from day one, um, if you're a midwife and you're doing birth, or if you're a midwife and you're not doing births, there is a risk of a bad outcome. So let's take a look at the non-birth midwife. And we have we ensure a lot of midwives who don't do births. Um, failure, failure to diagnose breast cancer, for example, is something that you can be practicing and you're moving along and everything is copacetic. And then suddenly you get, you, you know, you get hit with a claim three, four, five years after you treated a patient for an, an allegation of failure to diagnose breast cancer. Um, and that, it, that those types of claims can often lead to young deaths uh, or significant uh, injury or, or claims. And uh, you'll have, you would have no idea that it's even anywhere close to coming until well after you provided the services. The second more obvious one is having a, a baby that's born with a with a bad outcome, cerebral palsy, shoulder dystocias, things like that. Those you are usually more aware of when they happen. Uh, but because midwives have a unique and wonderful relationship with their patients, um, oftentimes these, um, these outcomes at, uh, end with the patient staying with the midwife and the midwife continues to treat them. And, um, and this is what actually one of the reasons that the program is so great is because we know we're insuring a pool of people that have special relationships with their patients, unlike relationships that are in other medical spheres. And that's a very important thing. Um, having said that, uh, you can, again, deliver a baby, uh, cerebral palsy, shoulder dystocia, as, uh, as, as the years move on, uh, you know that the statute of limitations for suing for a, for a child case um, often doesn't even begin until that child is 18. So you can have a lawsuit that comes 18 years plus whatever the statute of limitations. So let's say three years for the statute. Um, so you have a mom and a dad that are raising a child uh, with cerebral palsy, God forbid, or whatever. And suddenly they realize there's no way they can make ends meet. The expenses of raising this child are too great. Um, they now have had even two or three children since the last time. And now they realize, wait a minute, we have a lawsuit possibly against an insurance company, um, against a midwife. So we want to, we're going to go ahead and find an attorney. We're going to sue. Um, we're going to put the terrible palsy um, baby on the stand so that the jury can see them. And right or wrong, we're going to have a jury that's going to be sympathetic because all juries know that there's insurance. So right away, we can go ahead and, uh, and, and maybe ensure a 200000 or a million dollar outcome. Um, and so that becomes very, very important and it's a very difficult issue. Um, from my own experience, I have not had a year go by in which a midwife that we recommended buy tail insurance that did not lands up getting sued. So in, in every year now, 
there's an argument that's made by many that says, well, wait a minute, if I have no insurance and I have no assets, let them go at it. Um, what's going to happen anyway? So technically, that's actually true. But you don't know in 15, 20 years what assets you'll make. Maybe today you don't have any assets, that's, but you that, don't know the future. <laughs> that is very true. And also, we don't mm -hmm. know what type of attorney. So it's mm -hmm. a general general statement is a really good malpractice plaintiff's attorney is not suing if the recovery is not between three and five million dollars. Wow. So that is a huge number. Most midwives have maybe a million dollars in coverage. Many have 200,000 and 100,000 in coverage. So if you say, well, wait a minute, if they're not going to sue me unless I have three million dollars of coverage, great. I have nothing to worry about. But that that is those are the good attorneys and the really big firms, the guys who advertise at night at one o'clock, you know, if you have a phone, you have a lawyer, they're happy to get 30,000. They're happy to get 100,000 and keep 40,000. Or so a new practice yeah. starting in the area and they don't care if they win or lose. It's the it's the publicity. It's the the marketing that they're getting. And like people don't Absolutely. realize just there's other motives for getting lawsuits out there, not just the money in the end. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And, and that's why. I think it's important for every midwife, even those that warn their patients that they have no coverage or low coverage, to think about having something to protect them, if, if, even if only for the defense. Someone so that if, if a claim is filed against them, there's a hundred thousand dollars available to defend them. Um, or, and that's those legal lawyer fees. And I can't stress enough how amazing your guys' plans are to include that because many midwives have to defend themselves to the board of midwifery, the board of nursing, because the hospital complained and it wasn't anything they did wrong, but they they have a lot more hurdles to go through because they defended themselves versus they have your wonderful expertise. That's, mm -hmm. that's correct. And even mm -hmm. when a lawyer defends himself, the, 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 the saying is he has a fool for a client. So yeah. you, you don't want to represent yourself. Um, but any so 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 with that introduction, I wanted what I really want to kind of focus on is so now you're buying insurance. How do you decide what you want to buy, and and how do you protect against the long term impact of a suit? And there are two ways of doing that. One, of course, is an occurrence policy. An occurrence policy is a policy that covers you for the year that you paid premiums. If you cancel that policy, you continue to have coverage for any claims based on the services you provided that year. That's a great way of doing it. Uh, an occurrence policy is more expensive than the alternative policies that I'll explain in a minute, but that gives you guaranteed coverage for the, for the year, for the services you provided that year, for the rest of your life, and even after. The other alternative, which is the most prevalent one available, is called claims made coverage. Claims made coverage is less expensive than occurrence, but when you cancel the policy, in order to have coverage for any future claims, you need to pay one last premium called the tail. Tails can be anywhere from 115% of the current premium to 250% of the current premium. So most midwives, when they shop, don't shop the tail. And that really becomes an important issue to consider. Um, so if you think about it, if you're in a major city doing deliveries, you could have a premium of $25,000, dollars $30,000. If you have to pay two and a half times that, you're getting close to $100,000 in tail premium. Most midwives can't afford that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you have 115% of the premium, you're looking at something that's half of the mm -hmm. other costs. Maybe you can figure out a way to do that. So that, so number one, it's important if, if you buy claims made, which is again, 95% of all midwives are insured with claims made, that you take a look at the insurance companies. Uh, projections for tail premiums. And if the insurance company won't give them to you, find someplace else to go. Um, they, they all should be able to project the cost of tail premiums. Um, the, the question becomes, so how do you fund a tail premium? So, and why buy claims made? So let, we'll do that in a really, really quickly. Uh, an occurrence policy, let's say, has a premium of $1,000. A claims made policy in its fifth year will be around the same thousand but in its first year, it's about $330 a year. And then it moves up each year until it hits that thousand. So over that five year period, you land up saving probably as much as is as half or 100% of, of a tail premium. So the, so the question becomes, can you be disciplined enough to start saving some of that money in case the tail is needed? All right. So, um, that's one way. The easy way is to be disciplined, put away a little bit of money, 
we, you know, in any insurance broker should be able to tell you what the tail will be at the end of that year. You put away that kind of money. Now, if you're making $30,000 a year doing what you're doing, how do you put away any money? I wish I could help you on that one. That's, yeah. uh, that, that's a tough question. Having said that, it is important to think about that discipline. Um, you know, if your first year premium is $3,000, um, you probably need to be thinking about putting away in, at the lower end, let's say you have 115%, you want to think about putting away four or 5,000 for a tail so you don't end up being surprised. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that is an important thing to consider. Now, in many situations, you would not need to buy a tail. Okay, so let's talk about those. Most policies provide a free tail for death or disability. Um, and those free tails are immediate. If you have a policy and you've had it for 15 days and, and God forbid there's a death or a permanent disability, um, the, pre, the, the tail premium is waived and you get a free tail. If you retire with most companies, they will give you a free retirement tail, not with all, but with most, you get a free retirement tail. If you've worked with them for at least, insured with them at least for five years, and you're at least 50 or 55 years old. Um, so there is a benefit to not jumping around between different companies. Now, if you didn't know that, Izzy, so you're just yeah, giving yeah. us gems of wisdom. When I do my business consulting, I'm taking lots of notes from you right now. Well, mm -hmm. anytime. And, and, and by the way, if ever, if any of your listeners ever have a question about business practices, insurance, we don't charge for our time. They should just call us whether they're our clients or not. We're happy to help. Yeah, um, your your services and resources, I can't stress enough. You and Ann Geisler are the top, top ones for Midwife for sure. <laughs> and of course, we're on top. <laughs> yeah, There's some extra perks, perks you give above what Ann does for sure. Yes. <laughs> oh, anyway, so the um, so what I what I was, I was saying is that with the retirement tail, you have to fully and completely retire from the practice of midwifery. Um, so that's an important issue. Um, and, um, and that's something that we can take a look at. Not all carriers provide that free uh, retirement tail, but the main ones do. And so that becomes, that becomes important and uh, a, a reason for not jumping around. But also uh, what I will tell you is that if you know, let's say you're 30, um, you have very little reason to worry about retirement tails. Um, you're more, you're much more concerned about, um, other things than you How am I going to afford this? And am I going to stay at that place for a while? And what, yeah, what exactly that's going right. to look like. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. So let's take this now to the next step. So you say to yourself, okay, I've been practicing for five years. I don't know of anything bad that could have happened. I'm not going to buy that tail. I know that Izzy recommends it and, 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 and it makes sense, but I, I'm just not writing out a check for $22,000. Um, and, and I don't think I'm going to have any bad outcomes. So what I will tell you is most of the people who don't buy tails and get sued have that logic. But the important thing to keep in mind is that lawyers are not in a hurry to sue. Um, it's in their interest, let's say, going back to cerebral palsy, it's more much damage, more in their more interest cost. Yeah, mm -hmm. to put an eight-year-old on the stand than it is to put an infant on the stand, you know, or to show the infant. Um, so from as a practical matter, you know, you may be pr providing services and then uh, time comes you to say, you know what, I, I'm going to stop either for one year, two years, three years or four years, uh, and I'm not going to buy a tail. Um, and then to your surprise, five, six, seven years later, a lawsuit comes in. And I will tell you that it is not unusual to see that happen. Um, and it's not unusual for the person being sued not to have in insurance. So mm -hmm. my advice is that when you when you actually start your practice, you think about that. When you put together your pro formas for what it's gonna cost you to be in practice, don't leave out the cost of tail insurance. You wanna make the decision on tail insurance later, that's fine, but make the decision not because you don't have the money for it, make the decision because you just feel really comfortable. I mean, we'll advise against mm -hmm. it anyway, but, it, but if you have the money in the bank that you kind of put away for that, at least you know that you can make that decision. Yeah. Well, in a lot of the business consulting and discussions, when people come to me is we need an exit strategy from day one. Like, what if this happens? What if this happens? And a lot of times, if our intention is always to have a very successful practice, then in time you're going to sell, you can have that as part of your selling costs. Okay. I'm selling this business for a million dollars. 
50 to 100,000 of it is to cover my tail when I exit. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can put a budget in time, but you can also have, but yeah, don't get blindsided. It's just like those emergency accounts. Um, people don't give enough credit that there's a reason that's the most expensive part. When you're paying more for something, think in your head, that's probably the time I'm more likely to get sued. If something's cheap, an insurance company is based on algorithms and probability. If it's cheap, this is the less likely time you're gonna get sued. <laughs> That's true. And I, th I think when you use someone like Leslie to help you do those pro formas, um, it's good because Leslie has access to brokers that can give you that kind of advice and take it from there. So that's a good thing. So let's talk about one other angle on the tail insurance that's important. And that is here I am, I'm negotiating for a job. I don't control the policy at all. My employer controls the policy. How do I deal with that? How do I insure the tail? And again, this is an area where Leslie is going to be very, very helpful to you. Um, what you need to be uh, concerned about when you negotiate is obviously what are you going to get paid? Um, two, um, who's going to handle the tail if there is coverage? Most physicians have claims made coverage. Um, so they're going to need to deal with issues of tail insurance. Now, to get a little bit technical, but not too much, if you're getting a job at a hospital, the hospital probably has a self-insured trust and doesn't buy insurance at your level and probably will keep you covered forever. So what you need is a letter from them that says, should you leave our practice, we will continue to provide coverage for the work you did for us. If you get if you go to work for an OB or a primary care group, um, the odds are that they're covered under a claims made policy. And there's two ways that you can be covered. One, you can be covered sharing limits with them. So let's say they have a million dollars of coverage. If a student comes in, everybody there is sharing the million dollars. Often a tail is not needed when you leave. As long as the medical group keeps that policy in force, you may continue to be covered, but you should confirm that in writing. And the last option is you're insured by a medical group that has insurance for you on a claims made basis. And when you leave, a tail will be needed. And what you should do is you should make sure that you have a contract with your employer on who's responsible for the tail. So some employers will say to you, wait a minute, you stay with me for a year and suddenly I'm going to have to pay a $12,000 tail. No way, I'm not doing it. Now, you should try to negotiate for them to do it because they're only covering you for the work that you did for them. So the argument back to them is, I'm not asking you to cover me for work that I do next year. I'm only asking you to cover me for the work that I did for you. So yes, you should pay 100% of it. If you feel that you want the job and they're not going to give you the coverage for the year, then the way to deal with that is to say, look, I'll make you a deal. Why don't we agree that for each year that I work for you, you'll pay 20% or 30% of the tail premium. If I work for you for one year, you'll pay 20%. I'll pay 80%, assuming that I pay it. If I work for you for three years, you'll pay 60% and I'll pay the other 40%. And if I work for you for five years, you're gonna pay 100% of the premium for the tail no matter when I leave. And that gives you another way of kind of securing your tail uh, and, and doing it reasonably. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that most medical practices that run like businesses, when they talk, think about a compensation package, they're thinking about what it costs to hire you. So let's say that compensation package in their mind is $150,000. They're thinking about the $20,000 they may have to pay for health insurance, the $10,000 they may have to pay for malpractice insurance, um, the social security, the other pieces. So everything becomes, if they're, if they're smart about what they're doing, everything including the tail becomes part of that package. So yes, you might find that your salary lands up being reduced a bit by the cost of them factoring in a tail. Um, but it may well be worth it. Yeah, and I think that's inspiring midwives and providers. We have choices, we have options. I think sometimes people feel that scarcity mindset of like, well, there's few jobs for new grads, so I just have to take this one. They said this is what they do for everybody. I think it's giving the inspiration, create a win-win situation. Obviously, they're a business. If they're going to pay more costs somewhere, it's got to come from somewhere else. Or you give them, I'm going to do a longer vesting period so you know I'm committed, just like they give you a sign-on bonus or a loan repayment. It's just another negotiating piece that I think people need to talk about more. Agreed. And I, I think that if it's all done well, and, and by the way, these are all friendly negotiations. These are not unfriendly. Mm -hmm. But if it's all done well, you'll end up with a happy employer and a happy employee, and it's better <laughs> for everybody, and it's 
it's not something that is untoward or, or bad if asked for. You need to you need to be protective. Yeah, I think it's just too many times um, midwives are not thinking, well, oh my gosh, I'm going to work here for a long time. I'm like, even if you run your own business or work for someone else, exit strategies, what if this happens? What if you don't like there and you have to end, know your contracts really, really well, know what you're getting, ask lots of questions, because by the time you sign it, you can't ask those questions and you can't negotiate and clarify anymore. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And I think that pretty much covers the area of the tales that we wanted to do today. Um, okay. If you have any other particular questions, I'm happy to deal with that. And if I not, think we're in perfect timing. I've got three more minutes of your precious time, and I appreciate all the knowledge. Um, yeah, 2023, are there any high-level trends or anything that we should be watching out for on the landscape of that you're seeing? So we are seeing a lot more independent investors opening up um, birth centers around the country. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm getting many, many consultants that are reaching out to us for, for that, so I think that's a wonderful trend for midwives who don't want to be in their own practice, but want to work for someone else and still provide the quality service they provide. So we're seeing that. Um, and this is coming in at pretty high levels. So we're seeing people with significant assets who believe that they can turn a profit uh, by opening up a birth center or the like. I'm not seeing that as for home births uh, for obvious reasons, but I'm definitely seeing that in birth center births. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're getting a number of inquiries on that. Um, mm -hmm. We are seeing more competition in the market, so we have more companies that are selling. So uh, we access most of them. So that's an area that's nice. We don't know how long they'll stay. You know, whenever we get a new entry in the market, the first question is, are they going to get scared away after their first million dollar claim? Um, so that's a big one. Um, so that is certainly another area that that we're seeing, um, and we're seeing rate increases uh, now that we're post COVID or pretty much post COVID. Um, many of the companies that held the line on rate, even though they felt they needed to rate, are now taking those rate increases, and we're seeing we're seeing rate increases. Our program is not taking any rate increases, but we are seeing them across most of the other carriers. And yeah. that's really, in a nutshell, what we're seeing. I think it's still a great environment to be a midwife. Yeah, I mean, as far as the side outside of litigation, you and I could chat for hours about the demand and the need and the private practices opening left and right and just and a lot of these big investors, you and I are crossing paths with many of them, they want to change the community paradigm shift. Yes, they see the money, the finances to make it sustainable long term, but they're really their hearts in the right place. These people that I've been talking to that are birth advocates on the outside and they're like midwives aren't strong in business, but they're great at catching babies. So let me run their businesses and let them do mm -hmm. what they do. So I, I've been really excited. The investors you and I have been connecting with the last six, eight months that are coming into this arena. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Well, I want to wish you everybody, you. whoops. Go ahead. I, I want to wish you all, everyone, a happy, healthy new year. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. And yeah. it's always a pleasure mm -hmm. working with you. Okay. Thank you so much, Izzy. And you have a wonderful holidays as well. Thanks. Bye-bye now.